Good afternoon and welcome to this Global Strategy Forum event. Uh, today's topic is Britain in the 2020s, national security in a changing world. And to help us explore that subject, we're delighted to welcome Sir Mark Lyle Grant. Now, this is a hybrid event, so we have a live audience here in the National Liberal Club and we have one watching online. Um, I will be asking Sir Mark to kick off our proceedings in a few minutes. Um, and once he's made some introductory remarks, he and I will then just have a wider discussion on some of the issues that he's touched upon, after which we'll open it to question and answer from the audience. Now, if you are viewing online, would you please submit your question through the Q&A function, uh, and I will then read it out here uh, in the hall. If you are in the live audience, could you please wait until the microphone has reached you so that everybody can hear your question, including those online, and I should be grateful if you could announce who you are in the usual way. Uh, now, this event is being recorded, uh, and you will be able to see it on the GSF website in due course. Um, and the, uh, the, the account for that is hashtag GSFE events day. I say events day because the E is capital. Uh, and I'm sure you can find that online if you're not quite sure where it is. But now turning to today's event, we're absolutely delighted to have Sir Mark Lara Grant uh, with us. There'd be, there could be few people better qualified to talk about our national security than he. Uh, Mark originally, of course, qualified as a barrister, um, but he did see um, the error of his ways fairly early on and joined the diplomatic service in 1980. And over the next 35 years, he served in all sorts of parts of the world, um, as well as in the SDO and the Cabinet Office in London. Uh, he became one of the UK's most senior diplomats. He was the High Commissioner to Pakistan from between 2003-2006, political director in the FCO between 2007 and 9, and ambassador to the UN 2009-2015. But of course, it was in his role as National Security Advisor to David Cameron and then Theresa May until April 2017, where perhaps he garnered the, the breadth of knowledge which we will want to uh, mine this afternoon if we can. He's currently acting as a chair of uh, National, uh, sorry, he's currently a visiting professor at King's College in London uh, and a bench at Middle Temple and indeed a fellow at Eton College. Um, he has a number of consultancy roles into the bargain, but we're absolutely delighted that he's been able to join us this afternoon. Um, and so, Mark, if I may, I'll turn the floor over to you for about 10 minutes and we'll take it from there. National security in a changing world. A warm welcome. Thank you very much for those uh, warm words, Jock, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, perhaps I could just apologise for my appearance just at the moment. Um, I'm hoping it gives me a sort of musketeer-type duelling look. It was actually a sporting accident at the, at the weekend. Um, look, there's no doubt that in the last few years, the context, international and domestic, in which Britain's national security sits has changed considerably. We've had COVID, we've had Brexit, we've had the rise of China, we've had erratic and then faltering American leadership. We've got the rise of the tech companies, the rise of, of social media. But I would argue that despite the change in context, the fundamental threats and challenges that this country faces hasn't significantly changed. They fall into four main baskets. You've got the state-based threats, primarily obviously Russia and China. And I think what the latest crisis in Ukraine has showed was that many commentators who said it's all about China now were wrong. Because for the United Kingdom and for Europe, Russia is and has always been the more immediate direct threat to our security. Of course, China poses a more important strategic long-term threat, but the immediate threat to our way of life is Russia. Why? Because under President Putin, you know, his aim, to coin a phrase, is to make Russia great again. And given that there is a static population, a very narrowly based economy, one-tenth the size of China's, about 60% the size of the United Kingdom's, he thinks he can only do this in a zero-sum way by actually weakening his neighbours and his perceived enemies, whether that is NATO, the European Union, the United Kingdom, the United States. So Russia will remain that uh, immediate threat to us. The second basket of threats is the terrorism. Still primarily Islamist, although there is a rising uh, right-wing terrorist threat 
uh, as well. The intelligence agencies, law enforcement, have thwarted something like 30 plots in this country over the last four years. And then you have the cyber threat, both from hostile states, Russia and China again, but also Iran and North Korea are extremely uh, active in this space, but also from criminal gangs and individual conmen. I mean, who here in this room or online has not been subject of a scam email trying to get hold of your bank details? And what's interesting about those last two threats, the terrorism and cyber, is that governments alone cannot keep us safe. You know, it's always been said that the number one role of government is to keep its people safe. But in these two cases, it can do a certain amount and is doing a certain amount, but it can't keep us safe. You know, if a, a man is going to take a knife and start stabbing people in the street, or uh, he hires a car and starts running down pedestrians, the so-called lone wolf attack, there was actually very little government can do to prevent that happening. If there are more than one conspirator, it's more of a plot, they start talking to each other, you're in a whole different ball game, obviously. And likewise, on the cyber threat, it's companies, businesses, have to spend billions now of pounds, dollars, in protecting their data, and it's up to individuals to protect their passwords and be vigilant against uh, possible uh, scams. Government can't do all that for you. And then the fourth uh, basket is what you might broadly call global threats. Health pandemics, uh, climate change, uh, illegal migration, serious organized crime, human trafficking, and underpinning those uh, global threats is the erosion of the rules-based international order, which has helped to keep us safe and facilitate our prosperity ever since the Second World War. Now, against the context of those four baskets of threats, Britain is actually not that badly placed, in my view. The integrated review last year was actually quite a good document. You can argue about specific decisions in it, about the number of armed personnel, the number of ships, the number of planes, but the reality is that it guaranteed that uh, Britain would become, remain the largest defense spender in Europe, the third world power on uh, cyber, and it's promising a more outward-facing global Britain. That's a slogan, of course, but there is some substance behind it. And Brexit, in my view, has damaged a huge amount, but it hasn't directly damaged Britain's security. Why? Because our membership of the European Union has never been a key part of our security and defense apparatus. What's important for us here is NATO, um, the Five Eyes intelligence community, our permanent membership of the UN Security Council, our close relationship with the United States, uh, our defense arrangements with our key European allies like the Lancaster House Treaty with France, etc. All of those things are much more important than uh, EU membership. It is true that we no longer have automatic access to some of the EU-owned databases. We don't, the European Arrest Warrant, the Schengen Information System, Europol. But those are more important, actually, in the serious organized crime field than they are, for instance, in the terrorism uh, field. And what is more, I would argue, that there is no reason per se why Brexit should damage our international standing and influence and our ability to project a global Britain. Because that, again, has never depended on our membership of the European Union. It is depended on our fundamental assets and characteristics of the country, whether that is the economy or the history or the culture, the English language, the elite uh, institutions, the rule of law, the Premier League, the royal family. You know, those are the fundamental characteristics that people think of when they think of the United Kingdom that gives us influence around the world. And all of those things, maybe not the Premier League, but all the others, were there when we joined what was the common market in 1970s um, and are still there today. And it's not just my view. The British Council has done studies, young people around the world, which say that Brexit has not changed their fundamental view 
of uh, the United Kingdom. So, yes, Global Britain is a slogan and it's got to be backed up, but even after Brexit, we will still be a member of more international organisations than any other country. Uh, we will still have the fourth largest diplomatic network and we therefore still have some ability to influence things in the world. Now, I was in New York at the time in 2014, at the time of the Scottish referendum, and there's no doubt in my mind that Scottish independence would be much more damaging both to our security and to our influence around the world than Brexit ever could be because we would lose part of our population, part of our economy, we'd have to change the name of the country, might even cause people to question our membership of the Security Council, etc. But, and I'll finish on this point, that there is of course an important caveat, that if Brexit, or indeed COVID, leads to irreparable damage to our economy, or indeed to the breakup of the Union, then of course that would have a direct impact both on our security and on our international standing. So let me stop there, John. All right, thank you very much indeed. Uh, plenty to chew over. Um, let me start, if I may, by taking you back to uh, one point you made. You said the EU has never been a key element in our national security, or words to that effect, and that NATO is the, is the most important element there. And of course, in uh, politico-military terms, that's absolutely true. But in terms of wider security, um, it, it, it does go beyond NATO. And let me just read something from the, um, the Independent Review, uh, talking about Europe. It said, the UK will remain deeply invested in the security and prosperity of Europe. Our exit from the EU means we have the opportunity to follow different economic and political paths where this is in our interests and to mark a distinctive approach to foreign policy. Equally, we will work with the EU where our interests coincide, for example, in supporting the stability and security of the European continent and in cooperating on climate action and biodiversity. Uh, now, we're currently facing a crisis which certainly threatens the stability and perhaps the security of the European continent uh, uh, regarding Russia's actions in Ukraine. Uh, and here, uh, military action on the part of NATO uh, is simply off the table. I mean, Ukraine is not a part of NATO, and it seems uh, totally implausible that NATO nations are going to go and fight uh, for Ukraine. But there has been a very strong political response to Putin's actions. And, and what are being threatened, of course, are such things as sanctions. Um, and that will require a coordinated and hopefully coherent European response, which is difficult at the best of times. Uh, even when we were in the EU, it was difficult. Uh, now we're not in the EU. So my question to you is that given the importance of our uh, working with uh, EU partners, in the, the context of security within the European continent, what processes and mechanisms are now open to us to engage with them? Because we no longer have people in the engine rooms where policies are developed. I mean, policies, of course, are approved at the highest level by heads of state, but we all know that's not where they originate. They originate in the, in, in the working groups and in the engine rooms of the various institutions. How are we involved in those and how can we actually make our voice heard at that level within the EU, rather than having to have uh, senior officials and senior politicians trying to intervene at a fairly late stage in the policy formulation process? Yeah, that's a very fair question, and it wraps up a lot of different issues. Um, I would answer uh, as follows, that the very response that we're seeing to the Ukraine crisis, which is a united one, more or less, within NATO and more or less within the European Union shows that that can still be done even though we're no longer a member of the European Union. Look, I think Brexit is a strategic mistake for this country, mainly for economic reasons. Um, but in security terms, my point is it doesn't actually make a huge amount of difference. We still have arrangements with all our European neighbours. We still have a highly respected intelligence uh, service. We have a highly respected special forces. We work very closely with the French in a number of overseas deployments. They want to continue to work with us in that space. So I don't think there's any reason why Brexit as such should damage our response to a crisis like Ukraine on the European continent. I think that apart from economic uh, damage from Brexit. Personally, I think that one of the biggest is a sort of psychological uh, damage, that when we were members of the European Union, 
ministers, senior officials, had to go to Brussels on a very regular basis and meet with their European colleagues. Obviously, many times they resented it, they didn't like doing it, but it was actually a very valuable process because you had the opportunity in the margins of the various meetings to exchange ideas, not only on foreign security policy, but on domestic issues. And I think the risk is that we're going to lose that because ministers will not be going to meet their European counterparts. Every minister will go to Paris and they'll go to Berlin and maybe they'll go to Rome or Madrid, but they aren't going to be going to Athens and they're not going to be going to Bratislava and Prague and other places like that whilst they're in office. And I think you lose a huge amount by not having that collegial atmosphere. In some ways, I think that is one of the biggest uh, casualties, if you like, of, of Brexit. How um, important do you think that the, your, um, when you were national security advisor, your opposite numbers in, the, uh, in places like Germany and France clearly spoke with you frequently? Um, how strong do you think those relationships at that level are today, post-Brexit? I think they're probably pretty good. We did have weekly consultations with the sort of five European countries, but to be honest, much more important for me as national security advisor was when that was done with the Americans, maybe in a sort of quad format, as it were, with the UK, France, Germany, and the United States, because then you had real heft when you're talking about national security and defense. I hope, and I think the government's intention is certainly to continue to work both bilaterally with our key defense and security partners like France, the Lancaster House Treaty is extremely important, and indeed in a sort of E3 format with France and Germany uh, in particular as our main uh, economic and uh, security partners in Europe. I hope that uh, is still happening. Indeed, I personally would favor inviting France to join the Five Eyes community because I think France could bring a, quite a lot of uh, intelligence material from areas of the world where they are very strong and actually the Anglophone members of the Five Eyes community are rather less strong. So I think there would be some benefit. I think the other thing that we have traditionally been very weak on in this country is structure. Um, and this goes back perhaps to Margaret Thatcher's time as Prime Minister, but she hated these fixed summits. Um, but their fixed a uh, schedule of summits does have some benefit in generating ideas and initiatives and bilateral agreements. And I'm disturbed that we have not had an Anglo-French summit, for instance, for more than three years now. That can't be right. Um, we don't have that sort of um, tradition of fixed summits. And I think we do need to get back to that sort of structure to make up for the fact we're no longer <coughs> members of the European Union. Now, we could, of course, um, talk about Russia, Europe, and Ukraine all, all afternoon, and we may well return to those in questions, but I want to uh, widen the scene, if I could, uh, and I go back to the, uh, something, again, you said, and something that was in the Independent Review, and that's to do with China. Uh, and you said the, the Independent Review was wrong, it's not all about China, that Russia is the most immediate threat. But you did say, um, which uh, I think the Independent Review uh, was focusing on, that, that China poses some very serious long-term security challenges to us. Now, in the International Review, um, one of the uh, objectives, one of the strategic objectives was to shape the international order of the future. Uh, and the International Review said that we can no longer you know, just rely upon the status quo. We have to be much more proactive in ensuring that the international environment, the international rules-based order is one that is, is suitable for us. Um, uh, it said, our first goal is to support open societies and defend human rights. Um, the international order is only as robust, resilient, and legitimate as the states that comprise it. Um, and then it goes on to say that China is a systemic competitor, uh, and its increasing power and in international assertiveness is likely to be the most significant geopolitical factor of the 2020s. Um, uh, and it also goes on to say that China is a very important um, trading partner uh, and we must do more to trade with China. Uh, so basically it, it descends down through the various paragraphs into a list, quite a long list, of seemingly mutually contradictory aspirations with regard to China. Now the, uh, the House of Lords International Relations and Defence Committee, and I must 
declare an interest as a member of that committee, uh, published a report recently on the UK's security and trade relationship with China, subtitled A Strategic Void. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the conclusions was that the government's integrated review recognized China as both an important partner and a systemic competitor, but gave no indication of how it intended to reconcile the tensions and conflicts that are inherent in such a dual characterization. A promise to balance concerns around values or security with trade interests does not amount to a strategy. And nothing we've heard from the government during the course of this inquiry convinces us that they have thought seriously about objectives and priorities. Uh, and of course, uh, this committee was not the first in Parliament to say something of, of that nature. Now, do you recognise those concerns and what do you think the, the, how do you think the UK should be balancing its, uh, its approach to China given the very, very... Uh, dramatic consequences for us if the future international order uh, is not shaped in the right way, and given the fact that we're talking about a country that has been credibly accused of genocide. Yeah, you're asking a lot of uh, <laughs> a big, very big question there, Jock. Um, look, I, when I was National Security Advisor, our policy towards China changed rather dramatically with the change of Prime Minister. You know, under David Cameron, George Osborne, it was the golden era, and President Xi came on a, a big visit to the, to the UK. Um, and uh, I went out and had a security dialogue with the Chinese, etc. Um, then Theresa May came in, and suddenly everything got a little bit more security focused, um, and the Emphasis was on the threats, threats through Huawei, threats through espionage, cyber attacks, etc. And we went uh, fairly strongly in a slightly different direction, uh, a more security-based uh, direction. Somewhere in the middle is, is absolutely, I think, where we need to be. There is no doubt that China wants to change the world order in its image, and it has a right to have a greater say in the world order than it has had in the last 75 years. But the question is, are they looking to build up alternative structures or to get themselves a bigger say in the existing structures? I think myself it's a, a bit of both is what they're actually doing at the moment. You said that the key security, I think, sort of strategic issue in the future is, is China. Actually, it's the American-Chinese relationship. And we have to be a little bit humble here and recognize that the United Kingdom has not that much influence on that strategic relationship between uh, China and the United States, which will govern certainly our security and to some extent our prosperity over the next 30 years. We can influence events through the Americans, obviously, uh, upstream, and we can work with the uh, Europeans. But we shouldn't pretend that we have a very strong voice in that particular relationship and how it develops. Because it could be a question of it just being competitive, it could become confrontational, it could turn into sort of conflict. You know, all those on that spectrum uh, of relationships, you know, we're somewhere between competition and confrontation at the moment. Taiwan is a possible conflict uh, flare. Um, we don't know exactly in which direction it's going to go. But particularly at a time when we are no longer a member of the largest sort of trading bloc in the world, the European Union, I don't think it would be sensible for this country to not have an economic relationship with China. But it needs to be done with our eyes open and knowing the security risks that that sort of relationship has. Germany does it. France does it. There's absolutely no reason why we should not have um, a strong economic relationship with China at the same time as being fully aware and pushing back, whether it's on human rights issues that you mentioned, or Hong Kong, or uh, the South China Sea military buildup, or, or whatever it is. Every other country, including the United States, is able to ride both those horses, and I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to as well. But the, the challenge there, is it's, it's easy to say we should you know, strike a balance between the two, but an economic relationship means companies doing business with China. Yeah. Now, if we are to push back against China 
uh, quite seriously at times, then there seems little doubt that China will retaliate. Sure. Uh, and we've seen, what China, country... we've seen what China is doing in, in, in Lithuania, for example. Sure. So, so these companies that we're encouraging to, to engage economically with China are likely to suffer as a consequence of that. And it's, it does seem that there is a... Uh, th they need to understand that when pinch comes to shove, what will matter most? Will it, you know, are we prepared to suffer the consequences, the economic and political consequences, be they short, medium, or long term, of pushing back against China? Um, because if so, then the companies who are engaged in this uh, economic uh, uh, connection will need to take that into account and, and price it in. Uh, absolutely, they price it in, and they are private companies, and that's what the French companies do and the German companies do. They price in the risk. The returns in some sectors in China are massive, um, and therefore the risk can be priced in, and it's worth it. And if the worst comes to the worst and China starts nationalizing the companies or puts undue pressure on them so they have to withdraw from the country, well, then that's the, the insurance risk, as it were, that they, that they take. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be encouraging those companies to look at those opportunities, but with their eyes open. Mm -hmm. I don't see why we should be in any different position from France and Germany on that. Well, finally, and just sort of associated with that, of course, one of the key features of the integrated review was the, the so-called tilt to the Indo-Pacific region. Um, uh, it said we will pursue deeper engagement in the Indo-Pacific in support of shared prosperity and regional stability. Um, uh, given everything that you said about the balance between the risk from China and, and Russia and European stability, is this the right course, an Indo-Pacific tilt? I, up to a point, I would say. I think uh, the Indo-Pacific tilt is based on sort of two things. One, some of the natural allies we have in the region, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Korea, and others as part of our sort of containment strategy towards China. And it's also, secondly, about developing a strategic relationship with India. Personally, I have more faith in the first than the second. I think it's... Uh, India will be a very difficult uh, partner, uh, always has been, and I think it'd be difficult to say we have a special sort of s strategic relationship with China. I think that may be a little bit too ambitious. But the idea of saying we are now a global Britain, we are looking back east of Suez in a sort of general terms, I support that. And there have been some concrete steps taken to underpin it, like the AUKUS you know, submarine and technology a deal with Australia and the United States. I mean, that came about slightly haphazard, but it fits into the Indo-Pacific uh, tilt. So, yes, again, if you like, it's a slogan, but there is some substance behind it, and I think the overall approach is right. But we aren't going to be suddenly sending all our fleet to the Far East. We're not going to be stationing troops all over the Far East because we don't have that capacity. Well, let's open it up to questions from the audience, if we may. Who'd like to... Start us off. Yes, and my crane will be coming down. John Wilson, a journalist and a member of all the major think tanks in London. Um, I'm afraid, Sir Mark, I'm frightened to death with what you say. I'm probably one of the oldest people in this room. I was born at the time of Ch Neville Chamberlain. I lived through the Second World War and know what it's like to have bombs dropped on your head in this country. My father fought in the Second World War. I was in the services afterwards and know about the worry of the atomic bomb at that time in the 50s. Uh, and uh, I see the world moving inexorably as a, uh, towards the Third World War. We seem to be getting weaker as the time goes by, and our enemies seem to be getting stronger. When you think that Russia, which has only a fraction of this country's GDP, is beating the drum and having all the Western people d d dance to their tune, I find it extremely frightening. Uh, and China, uh, I was at a meeting with uh, Frank Gardner the other day, and he said that China is determined to have world domination by 2050. Would you like to comment on all these points, please? <laughs> you, sure. uh, you, uh, can you keep it to an hour? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm glad you raised the historic uh, perspective because my father uh, died last year and, and year before last, and he was 104. And he was born in 1915. And I went, I went to see him in the care home when we were allowed to um, shortly before he died. Um, he said, Mark, he said, I'm very worried about the world that I'm leaving. And I said to him, listen, Dad, you were born in 1915, one year into the Great War. You fought throughout the Second World War. You visited Hiroshima three months after the atom bomb was dropped. You served in the army throughout the Cold War. You know, compared to what you've been through, 2020, which is when it was, isn't that bad in our security. We are not, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that strategically we are safer than we have been for hundreds of years. Our territory is not being directly threatened. Yes, Russia is threatening Ukraine and nibbling at all the sort of edges, but it's not directly threatening to invade the United Kingdom. We haven't been in that position many times. Conflict deaths is the, the lowest level they've been for 150 years. So we mustn't lose sight of the fact that actually in a strategic sense, we're not in a bad place um, in security terms. Now, China, you're absolutely right. China is a rising power and it wants to become the global power. That's fine, global powers come and go. What is difficult for us is that it's, their value system is completely different from ours. So the sort of democratic democracy, the rule of law, human rights on which uh, the Washington consensus, the post-World War consensus was built, they don't subscribe to that. And therefore they want to bring in uh, a parallel system um, which will be different. Will that lead to a global conflict? No, I don't think we're anywhere near a global conflict at the moment. I think we are much closer to a sort of uh, uh, a segmentation um, going back to a sort of cold war, if you like, where the world is split into different economic blocks um, and China will be uh, leading at that sort of alternative structure. And that has very damaging implications for the United Nations and, and sort of global uh, governance. Um, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a global conflict in the near future, in my view. Now, maybe I'm being uh, complacent, but as I say, my father gives me historical perspective of the sort of things that he went through and met some of them you went through. Could I just follow up and ask you, would, would, you, um, uh, would you feel that way with regard to a major miscalculation over Taiwan that drew China and the US into an armed conflict? Look, it depends what you think. I do not think that President Xi ambitious though he is to reintegrate in his terms uh, Taiwan with mainland China on his watch, I don't think he's going to be taking military action because he knows that's a pretty serious red line. If it happens, the response will be very significant. Whether it will be military and lead to a sort of global conflict, um, I'm less certain about. We have a question from Sir David Logan. Um, he says, uh, he asks, your four categories of threat are all ones in which the EU plays an increasingly important role. While European defence is still largely an organisation of acronyms, that's clearly going to change, to judge by the views of EU leaders. They clearly think that the Europeans will in due course have to look to their own defence. In this framework, do you not think that the UK's non-membership of the EU will put us at a serious disadvantage in terms of our own security? I disagree with you, David, on that, I'm afraid, because I've spent a lot of my career, one way or the other, talking about European uh, security. And it's a deeply frustrating business because it is all about acronyms. It is all about organizations. It's all about, let's have a new organogram, let's have a new command center, let's have new structures. But where is the capability? Um, and when you talk about capability, you've still got a massive deficit in Europe. You take France out of the equation and you're left with very little. And all the sort of talk of strategic autonomy in Europe, it's been around for 20 years and very little has happened. Slowly, very, very slowly, there has been a small increase in uh, defense spending by our European partners. But still only five of the NATO members, and of course we and the Americans are two of them, spend uh, up to 2% of their uh, budget on defense. I mean, that is, 
totally inadequate. And Germany are way down, Italy and Spain nowhere. I mean, so we mustn't think that somehow there is going to be a, a European defense uh, organization with a proper European army um, and capabilities in the near future. It simply is not going to happen. And that's why our European partners do turn to the UK when it comes to hard security. And I don't think that fundamentally changes as a result of Brexit. Yes, David Henney. <clears throat> uh, we just wait, wait for the mic. Could you just wait for the mic? Sorry. Mark, you haven't said anything very much about the tools which we would have to use if a global Britain is to be established. Uh, you've said nothing about the cut in overseas aid. You said nothing about the squeeze that's being put on the BBC World Service inevitably from uh, what the government's announced on overall spending, on overall income for the BBC. You said nothing about the cutting back of the British Council, and you said nothing about the lack of resources of the FCDO. Uh, could you have a go at those four? Absolutely. <laughs> no, when I was in uh, New York, and I'm sure you did the same, David, in your time, I was always happy to stand up and say, Britain is the only G20 country that has met its commitment um, on 0.7% on uh, GDP. And not G7, but G20. And the Saudi Arabian ambassadors used to stand up and say, no, no, Saudi Arabia spends 1.1% or something, um, which, of course, is completely bogus. Um, so it was a very strong selling point. However, I think it was wrong to legislate that into, uh, into um, law. Um, I think that was a mistake. It became much too rigid and meant, for instance, that when their hurricane hit you know, Turks and Caicos or one of our dependent territories, we weren't able to use the aid budget in order to um, help them out. So I think that was a political uh, misjudgment to put that into law. I never supported that. But I do support the commitment even though we have to deviate from it for special circumstances, COVID at the moment. And I hope that the government will get back to spending 0.7 because it is important. In terms of the other soft power, you're absolutely right. These are all elements of our soft power. I mentioned several uh, others. Um, the BBC World Service, absolutely, still has a certain amount of credibility, um, maybe less. You go around ministers' offices in the Middle East, South Asia nowadays, they tend to have Al Jazeera on in the background or uh, they don't tend to have BBC World Service as they used to have 20 years ago uh, when you, you saw it then. Um, I think uh, in terms, I did mention, I think that we're still the fourth widest sort of diplomatic network. Yes, there's been a budget squeeze um, and I think more money could be spent on, on, on uh, diplomacy, but nonetheless, fourth largest diplomatic network, it's still quite significant. So there will be budgetary squeezes, and we're probably going to face another one as we're paying for COVID and the NHS and everything else, and that's uh, fair enough. But I felt that the integrated review made enough of a commitment on the resource front to ensure that our international position uh, should be maintainable over the next few years. A question from David Snoxville. Uh, the Secretary of State for International Trade said in Parliament yesterday a deal with India would help to put global Britain at the heart of the Indo-Pacific region, cementing our position as a leader among a network of countries committed to free trade and support the levelling up agenda across the UK. Uh, what, what are your views on that? I'm sure it would, but I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> you know, the, in my experience, um, the three most unilateral countries in the world are the United States, Russia and India. Um, and I think agreeing a trade deal with the United States can be extremely difficult. Uh, agreeing one with India, even more difficult. Hmm. Um, I think we had a yes, question down in the front here, Jackie. Shaka, just Thank you. Uh, my name is Andreas. I'm from the Danish Embassy. Uh, a question on the integrated view mentions global Britain, it mentions the Indo-Pacific tilt uh, and a focus more to the east. Do you see that that being, if it's more than just a slogan, do you see that that could harm in any way the credibility of the UK in order to be a 
defense and security ally to the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries, perhaps? I certainly hope not. I mean, uh, the proof will be in the pudding, um, and we're only sort of one year into this sort of integrated review implementation, but there probably could have been more in the integrated review about the defence and security relationships with Europe. It is there, as, as Jock read out at, at one point, but some substance needs to be put into it. I absolutely uh, agree with that. And there's a number of different ways of doing that through the, you know, the Nordic Council, the Arctic Council, and those sort of, in the, you're talking about in those areas, but also in bilateral uh, defence and security links with some of our key uh, partners in, in Northern Europe. So I hope there will be a lot of effort and time put into it. I would like to see that happen, um, but we haven't seen it yet, put it that way. Gisela. Um, Gisela Stewart, and nice to see you. Hi, Gisela. And uh, amongst the other things, Chair of Wilton Park. Can I ask you about higher education institutions and the relationship to China? Uh, if you were asked to advise university vice chancellors and say we have become heavily dependent on the high earnings of overseas students, particularly from China, what's a security risk and how do you think we should react now? I am very concerned about that, uh, Gisela, yes, uh, more than I am in many ways about sort of cyber attacks against the government um, because government is actually relatively well protected. Uh, and has a lot of ability to protect itself against Chinese uh, espionage and influence. But academic institutions, I think, have been too quick to take Chinese money for understandable reasons. Um, but nonetheless, I don't think it necessarily poses a security threat in traditional terms, but it certainly poses a threat to uh, freedom of speech and information. But, and we've seen that with some very distinguished uh, universities and colleges of distinguished universities who now essentially have cancelled any public criticism of the Chinese Communist Party. And that is very alarming if universities are influenced in the way they uh, teach and act as a platform for uh, public speaking because they are taking money from, uh, from China. So I am concerned about that and I think the educational institutions need to be extremely wary of doing that. Uh, Richard. Uh, Richard Risby and I chair the British Ukrainian Society. Um, I just wanted to ask you about um, our role in the Ukrainian dynamic. If you were to go to Kiev, there is one country which is saluted overwhelmingly more than any other, which is the United Kingdom. Absolutely clearly. And um, it is not something which is shouted about by the Ukrainian government too much because they are on a European trajectory with the association agreement and everything else. I just am not clear how Ukraine can deal with the situation specifically because, yes, um, Putin wants to be, you know, say Russia's on the there's a major power, talking to the Americans, etc. But at the same time, a few months ago, he wrote an astonishing article which was saying, we're joined at the hip with Ukraine, we're soul brothers as a religion, all the sort of thing that goes with it. So do we have any role at all? We have a poor relationship with Russia, specifically, or is there something that uh, we can do uh, that can actually uh, withdraw the tensions from this area? It's not obvious, because of this extraordinary emotional view that Putin appears to have about Ukraine, specifically. Yes, I, you're absolutely right about the, the British-Ukraine um, relationship, and I've been you know, to Kiev at least uh, a number of times myself. Um, and I think we are doing a certain amount. I mean, we've actually been quite closely involved in, in helping Ukrainian security for some time, but that's obviously been ramped up in recent months, uh, both in terms of training and in terms of the provision of, of now... Uh, Non, uh, non lethal but defensive military equipment, etc. So I think we're doing more than most European countries in trying to sort of bolster Ukrainian security. But you hit the nail on the head when you say that for President Putin, this is a emotional issue rather than a rational one. I am still, I believe that there is an opportunity to avoid a full scale uh, invasion of Ukraine. I think there is still some scope for diplomacy. 
Um, and there is scope for Putin to realize that the cost for Russia and for him personally would be too great of that sort of military adventure. But what worries me, and the reason that I'm not 100% confident of that, is that it is not always a rational decision because he has this belief that Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia are all part of the same uh, entity. What he needs to be persuaded is that the, you know, the response will be sufficiently strong and damaging for him and that the Ukrainian people simply will not lie down and accept it. And it'll be much more like Afghanistan than it would be uh, like Georgia um, for, uh, for Russia. Um, that there will be a resistance movement, uh, yes, based in the west of the country. Um, I'm sure other European countries will support that resistance movement and Russia will get bogged down. But having said that, Putin, I think, has a number of military options at his disposal, short of a full-scale land invasion. And no doubt he's considering other forms of uh, uh, infringing on Ukraine's sovereignty, hoping that it will get a lower level Western response. And I think part of the, the sort of narrative that, that Boris Johnson and other leaders who are going to Kiev need to give is that we don't distinguish between sort of minor incursions and major incursions. There will be a very tough response if Russia goes beyond what it's already done. Question from Mohammed Hassan from the Egyptian Embassy. Thank you for this fruitful discussion. Do you think that the UK's tilt towards the Indo-Pacific would affect the role it plays within the Middle East? I don't think so. The Middle East gets a, a strong mention in the, in the integrated review. We have more uh, troops, um, training facilities, um, high-level defense arrangements with Middle Eastern countries than we've had for, for some considerable time. I think the Middle East I'm more worried about from a strategic point of view because there has been an American withdrawal from the Middle East. Um, and what you've seen is uh, greater involvement, direct involvement by Russia, and greater direct involvement by China, and the American, and therefore, inevitably, the Western influence getting weaker. I mean, what is striking about the Arab world at the moment, in my view, is it's being determined by three non-Arab powers, basically. And the traditional Arab leaders are extremely weak, including Egypt. Uh, Syria, obviously, and others. So you've got Turkey, um, you've got Iran, and you've got Israel, who are actually the main players now in the Middle East, none of whom uh, are Arab. So I think there is an interesting changing dynamic in the Middle East. I don't think myself that Britain will take its eye off the Middle East, because again, it's still closer to us, it's still a nearer neighbor than the Far East, um, and we do have some pretty close defense links, in particular with the Gulf states. So, Mark, uh, right at the beginning of your very interesting presentation, uh, you talked about a choice uh, in strategic focus between Russia and China, uh, pointing out that for uh, people in the UK, indeed in Western Europe, Russia was the, the, the greater threat. Is this choice any longer real? I mean, given the extent of strategic coordination, uh, the ever-deepening strategic partnership, as President Xi Jinping likes to call it, uh, between Russia and China, is it not the case that we are actually confronting a, a kind of a, a colossus of a strategic challenge uh, with twin uh, centers in Moscow and Beijing, but very closely coordinated, and that all that we're discussing here is which end of that colossus was us more? Yeah, forgive me if I, if I suggested it was a choice. I never intended it to be a straight binary choice between Russia and China. Of course, one has to uh, deal with both, as it were. The point I was making is that if you're sitting in Washington, China is your neighbor um, as much as Russia is. And for them, very much the focus was China. And part of American withdrawal from the Middle East, uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, was about focusing on the Far East and the threat from China. One of the, possibly, one of the motivations behind what Putin is doing is to say, hang on a sec, America, I am still around. And in that sort of political aim, he's already succeeded by what he's done on Ukraine, because suddenly Joe Biden is ringing up 
um, uh, President Putin, uh, Antony Blinken is talking to Sergei Lavrov, um, and suddenly, you know, Russia is back center stage, and China has sort of slipped back a bit in, in the order of agenda in Washington. So Putin has achieved something that actually the Europeans are quite happy about because they were worried. The European governments have been worried that Washington was focused too much on China and not enough on European security. Well, that, you know, that is finished for the time being, at least. So oddly, there is a little bit of confluence of, or uh, overlap of interest in this respect by Putin uh, and by uh, Western European countries. None of that takes away from the fact that in the longer term, as I think I said, the bigger strategic threat is, is China, and we mustn't lose sight of that. But China is not directly undermining our way of life in this country. It is not directly attacking our political institutions, interfering in our referenda, inter interfering in our political elections. China is not doing that. Russia is. It's, China is not assassinating people on our streets. You know, it, it is a slightly different uh, order of immediacy against the longer term strategy, but it's certainly not a choice. Robin Butler, House of Lords. How do you see the changes in energy sources and particular attempts at reduction in, in carbon dependency affecting the balance of power in the world? I think the biggest development in this area is the sort of autarky of the United States. The fact that America now is no longer dependent on fossil fuels from the Middle East is the biggest strategic change in the last 30, 40 years. Um, and you only have to go back that sort of time to realize how dependent the West was on, on, on oil and gas uh, from the Middle East. Now that America is independent, that has changed its focus. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's showing less interest in the Middle East region than it has done uh, in, in the past. But energy security for Europe is a massive challenge, and, and it's, it's come up in spades in terms of the Ukraine crisis because of the one of the most effective potential sanctions against Russia is not starting, not turning on, if you like, the Nord Stream gas pipeline. From Britain's point of view, that is not planning to take any gas from the Nord Stream pipeline, it's an obvious measure that would have a significant impact on, on, uh, on Russia. But for many European countries who are very dependent on Russian gas, not just Germany, but also Spain, Italy, others, um, it's a very difficult decision for them to take because they will take an economic hit. Britain would take an economic hit because energy prices will rise more generally. And obviously, all the energy we get from Norway, and even from the North Sea, from uh, Qatar and other places would be affected, but we would be much less affected. So it's natural for us to argue that this should be on the sanctions table, but that has not, as far as I know, that has not been formally agreed, um, but it hasn't been taken off the table. So it's certainly, certainly there as a threat, but it would have some comp complications. Now, when you look at the uh, moving to more green technology and decarbonization, I think uh, obviously in the longer term, that puts Britain in quite a strong position in theory because we have a number of possible alternative sources of energy. Um, but I think it's more an economic question about whether we can afford the economic cost of that um, by moving away from fossil fuels as fast as the government would like to do. Um, that doesn't have a direct impact on our security, um, but of course money to spend on security will be reduced um, if we are paying a higher price for our energy because of the decarbonisation process. Well, following on nicely from that is a question from Richard Molyneux, who asked, uh, Germany and parts of the EU can be strangled by Russian control of their gas. We are vulnerable to a major cyber attack or the severing of cables. Would it be better to let Russia have control of Ukraine and not take steps which will help to strengthen a menacing Russian-Chinese axis? Yeah, yeah. I think probably, you know, Neville Chamberlain thought the same thing. <laughs> no, I don't think that is realistic. Um, you know, we cannot, if we accept that sovereign borders can be forcibly changed in Europe again, then we are undermining our own rules-based international order. And I just simply do not think we can tolerate that. There's, there is 
100% risk of a spillover from Ukraine to other parts of Europe if uh, that happened. Um, I'm thinking of places like you know, Moldova, uh, the Baltic states. Um, I think uh, it would, there's absolutely no guarantee whatsoever that President Putin would stop at, at, uh, at Ukraine. Um, so I think it would be a very, very dangerous policy to pursue to say, you know, let's, uh, let's let him have Ukraine. Um, that would be extremely damaging to our security and European security. Clive Newell, <coughs> former <coughs> British embassies, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, Turkey, Russia, amongst others. Uh, could you say a little bit more about Turkey's place in the world? You mentioned it in the Middle East context, but as a, partner, as a trading partner for the UK, I worry. Yeah, I, I do. I also worry about the, the direction that uh, Erdogan is, is taking uh, Turkey. Um, you know, Turkey is a country that spends a lot of money on defense and therefore plays a vital role in NATO, but is also the bridge between uh, NATO and the Eurasian uh, continent, but has its own interests which cut across many of ours. Now, British policy for many years, um, and some of you will know this better than I, that to keep Turkey in a sort of Western orientated position, offering the prospect of EU membership was an extremely important uh, lever or uh, incentive. Um, that has now been dashed and Britain was always the sort of strongest supporter of it uh, in the long term. Um, and now that we're not in the European Union, essentially it's off the table for the foreseeable future. And that does leave uh, Turkey floating free, if you like. What they're doing is using that to extend influence in the Middle East. I mean, uh, you can argue either way whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but also they're very conscious of the relationship with Russia. Um, and that relationship is a little bit closer than the Americans in particular want and probably is desirable given that it's a NATO ally. I think a lot does depend on Erdogan and his successor because you know, Turkey is a country that can go in different directions, and I don't think its course is set for all time. You know, whereas I wouldn't put my hand on my heart and say that once Putin goes, Russia is going to turn into a, a soft, democratic, pro-Western country. Um, with Turkey, it could flip very, very quickly, I think. Um, I think we're right to spend a lot of time and effort on Turkey, um, because it's an important country, and we have traditionally had quite a close relationship with Turkey, and we need to build on that. And time for one last question from the floor. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, David Cope from Cambridge University. And just a quick point, question asked over there on energy. Actually, one of the most interesting areas for potential collaboration between the UK and both Russia and China is in nuclear energy. I just want to flag that up, OK? Um, but I, I want to come back to you on this point about university research, because you made some comments which I found a little bit troubling. Um, I think people don't understand the actual function of university research. And what we've done over the past 20 years now, I think has built up some very good relationships, not just with China, but particularly. Um, now, we're not stupid. We know that espionage is going to go on. We, it's been going on all the time. I mean, one recalls the uh, case of the Americans and the Echelon uh, business back in the 1980s when they were trying to steal European uh, uh, commercial r research results. Um, but it worries me that you seem to be implying that you wanted to see some greater, well, let's call it government interference uh, in the functioning or of academic research, particularly research that has some sort of commercial focusing. Um, do you want to say just a little bit more on that? Yeah, no, I certainly don't want more government uh, interference in, in management and administration of, of universities. And it's not primarily the espionage threat that I am concerned about. I mean, there are some striking statistics that 70% of students in the United States who are studying technology and science subjects are foreign students. So, of course, there is a threat of, uh, of uh, stealing secrets and things. No, my concern about British universities taking uh, Chinese money is much more about whether that dilutes their um, freedom of speech 
and uh, acting as a platform for free discussion. And there have been instances, including particularly at Cambridge, and as a Cambridge alumnus, I feel that, where uh, individuals have not been allowed to criticize the Chinese government because they are concerned that some of that Chinese research money or, or money for bursaries or professorships, or chairs or whatever, uh, will be withdrawn. And I think that is damaging. Not for the government to sort out, it's for the universities to sort out, um, because it will damage their international reputation if they are seen to be not able to offer a platform for full and honest and open debate. Well, Mark, we've covered an enormous amount of ground, um, but of course we've left uh, an even larger <laughs> amount of ground uncovered. I mean, we haven't even touched on climate change and migration flows, which are not just economic issues, but also security issues. Uh, perhaps just as well, because who knows what on earth we could say about them, except that they are really significant challenges for the future. But anyway, you've given us uh, uh, an enormous amount to think on. You've uh, uh, you, you have covered a wide range of topics and we're enormously grateful to you for uh, giving up your time today and coming uh, and, and addressing the questions uh, so forcefully and eloquently. Um, I would like to thank our technical team who have done such a magnificent job in putting on this hybrid event. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Jacqueline Jinks, of course, uh, who is, uh, the, as ever, the prime mover. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for participating in the event today, whether here in the National Liberal Club or online. Uh, but most of all, Mark, our warmest thanks to you. Thank you very much.